Hello, and welcome to Shakespeare 2020 LA. Shakespeare 2020 LA is the Los Angeles division of Shakespeare Project 2020, a worldwide challenge created by Ian Desher to read the entire Shakespeare canon in 2020. Shakespeare 2020 LA is comprised of Los Angeles local professional actors. We began meeting to read and workshop the plays in addition to performing live public staged readings at LA Public Libraries, which we look forward to resuming when we're able to gather again in person. Our reading today is King Lear, and our players are Jason Rennie, Martin Hillier, Christopher Carbo, Taylor Marr, Sasha Venn, Megan Wells, Ron Dorn, Cameron Prince, Chris Klein, Ariel McIntyre, and Leilani Toon. I'm Mary Carrick. Dennis Krosnick, founding member of Shakespeare and Company in Lenox, Massachusetts, in addition to training and inspiring a generation of actors and teachers, who in turn will educate and inspire generations to come, spent, a slight understatement, considerable amount of time on King Lear. He directed Olympia Dukakis in The Lear Project, studying, workshopping, and extensively performing the title role, Dennis embodied the mission of Shakespeare and Company to espouse Shakespeare's text and the depth of human emotion unveiled in the mining of the human experience. What does it mean to be alive? The current shared consciousness in the worldwide pandemic, a shift that has rocked our complacencies, awareness, and it feels like the end of the world. Lear built his kingdom on what he thought was a watertight, rock-solid foundation, that he could enjoy his retirement in the luxury and adulation of his family and subjects. Ah, but the worst of human frailties, pride, envy, gluttony, greed, sloth, lust, and wrath crept in. The carnage of King Lear's earthly kingdom is laid waste and the images of storm, wind, bodily harm, and loss of vision. Just when we think all is lost, forgiveness and redemption remain in the last encounter of Lear and Cordelia. Like Pandora's box, hope, which is whispered from Pandora's box only after all the other plagues and sorrows have escaped, is the best and last of all things. Without it, there is only time, and time pushes at our backs like a centrifuge, forcing us outward and away until it nudges us into oblivion. Edgar's parting words, the weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. We must all tell the truth and our stories so that, like Lear and Cordelia in the final moments, we experience forgiveness and reconciliation. Dennis, this one is for you. Our Christopher Carbo is well up to the task as are our astute players. So please settle in, relax. And as Shakespeare's audience was known for experiencing, hear our play. William Shakespeare's King Lear. Act 1, Scene 1, King Lear's Palace. Enter Kent, Gloucester, and Edmund. I thought the king had more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. It did always seem to so to us, but now in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the dukes he values most, for equalities are so weighed that curiosity in neither can make choice of either's moiety. Is this not your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, hath been at my charge. I have so blushed to acknowledge him that now I am brazed to it. I cannot conceive you. Sir, this young fellow's mother could, whereupon she grew round womb, and had indeed, sir, a son for her cradle, ere she had a husband for her bed. Do you smell a fault? 
I cannot wish the fault undone, the issue of it being so proper. But I have a son, sir, by order of law, some year elder than this, who yet is no dearer in my account. Though this knave came something saucily to the world before he was sent for, yet was his mother fair. There was good sport at his making, and the whore son must be acknowledged. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? No, my lord. My lord of Kent? Remember him hereafter as my honorable friend. My services to your lordship. I must love you and sue to know you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. He hath been out nine years, and away he shall again. The king is coming. Attend the lords of France and Burgundy, Gloucester. I shall, my lord. Meantime, we shall express our darker purpose. Uh, give me the map there. Know that we have divided in three our kingdom, and tis our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we on burden crawl toward death. Our son of Cornwall, and you, are no less loving son of Albany, we have this hour a constant will to publish our daughter's several dowers that future strife may be prevented now. The two great princes, France and Burgundy, great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our court have made their amorous sojourn and here are to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state, which of you shall say we doth love us most? That we our largest bounty may extend where nature doth with merit challenge. Goneril? Our eldest born, speak first. Sir, I love you more than word can wield the matter. Dearer than eyesight, space, and liberty, beyond what can be valued, rich or rare, no less than life with grace, health, beauty, honor, as much as child e'er loved or father found, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable. Beyond all manner of so much, I love you. <laughs> Help Cordelia speak. Love and be silent. Of all these bounds, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests and with champagnes rich, with plenteous rivers and wide-skirted meads, we make thee lady. To thine and Albany's issue be this perpetual. What says our second daughter, our dearest Regan, wife of Cornwall? Speak. I am made of that self-metal as my sister, and prize me at her worth. In my true heart, I find she names my very deed of love. Only she comes too short that I profess myself an enemy to all other joys which the most precious square of sense possesses. And find I am alone, felicitate in your dear highness's love. Poor Cordelia. And yet not so, since I am sure my love's more ponderous than my tongue. To thee and thine hereditary ever remain this ample third of our fair kingdom. No less in space, validity, and pleasure than that conferred on Goneril. Now, our joy. Although our last and least, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interest, uh, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing? Nothing. Well, nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. I'm happy that I am. I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty. According to my bond, no more, no less. How? Oh. How, oh, Cordelia? You mend your speech a little, lest you may mar your fortunes. Good, my lord. You have begotten me, bred me, loved me. I return these duties back as the are right fit. Obey you, love you, and most honor you. Why have my sister's husbands if they say they love you all? Happily, when I shall wed, the Lord that hand must take my flight shall carry half my love with him, half my carry and duty. 
Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters, to love my father all. But goes thy heart with this? Aye, my good lord. So young, and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. <laughs> thy truth, then, be thy dower. For by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate and the night, by all the operation of the orbs from whom we do exist and cease to be, here I disclaim all my paternal care, propinquity, and property of blood, and as a stranger to my heart, and me hold thee from this forever. The barbarous Scythian, or he that makes his generation messes to gorge his appetite, shall to my bosom be as well neighbored, pitied, and relieved as thou, my sometime daughter. Good, my liege. Peace, Kent. Come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery. Hence, and avoid my sight. So we might rave my peace as here I give her father's heart from her. Call France who stirs, call Burgundy. <laughs> Cornwall and Albany, with my two daughters' dowers digest the third. Let pride, which she calls plainness, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power, preeminence, and all the large effects that troop with majesty. Ourself, by monthly course, with a reservation of an hundred nights by you to be sustained, shall our abode make with you by due term. Only we shall retain the name and all the addition to a king. This way... Revenue, execution of the rest, beloved sons, be yours, which to confirm this coronet part between you. Royal Lear, whom I have ever honoured as my king, loved as my father, as my master followed, as my great patron thought on in my prayers. The bow is bent and drawn, make from the shaft. Let it fall, rather, though the fork invade the region of my heart. Be kent unmannerly when Lear is mad. Why wouldst thou do, old man? Think'st thou that duty shall have to dread to speak when power to flattery bows? To plainness honours bound when majesty falls to folly. Reserve thy state, and in thy best consideration check this hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment. Thy youngest daughter does not love thee least, nor are those empty-hearted whose low sounds reverb no hollowness. Kent, on thy life no more. My life I never held but as a pawn to wage against thine enemies, nor fear to lose it, thy safety being motive. Out of my sight! Be better, Lear, and let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Oh, now by Apollo! Now by Apollo, king, thou swearest thy gods in vain. Oh, vassal miscreant! And dear sir, forbear. Kill thy physician, and thy fee bestow upon the foul disease. Revoke thy gift, or whilst I can vent clamour from my throat, I'll tell thee thou dost evil. <laughs> hear me, recreant, on thine allegiance, hear me. Thou that, that thou hast sought to make us break our vows, which we durst never yet, and with strained pride to come betwixt our sentence and our power, which nor our nature nor our place can bear, our potency made good, take thy reward. Five days we do allot thee for provision to shield thee from disasters of the world, and on the sixth to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. If on the tenth day following thy banished trunk be found in our dominions, the moment is thy death. Away! By Jupiter this shall not be revoked! Fare thee well, king. Sith thus thou wilt appear, freedom lives hence, and banishment is here. The gods to their dear shelter take thee, maid, that justly thinkst and hast most rightly said. And your large speeches may your deeds approve, that good effects may spring from words of love. Thus Kent, O princes, bids you all adieu. He'll shape his old course in a country new. France and Burgundy, my noble lord. 
My lord of Burgundy, we first address towards you, who with this king hath rivaled for our daughter. What in the least will you require in present hour with her, or cease your quest of love? Most royal majesty, I crave no more than hath your highness offered, nor will you tender less. Right, noble Burgundy. When she was dear to us, we did hold her so, but now her price is fallen. Sir, there she stands. If all within that little seeming substance, or all of it, with our displeasure, peace, and nothing more, may fitly like your grace, she's there, and she's yours. I know no answer. Will you, with those infirmities she owes, unfriended, new adopted to our hate, dowered with our curse, and strangered with our oath, take her or leave her? Pardon me, royal sir. Election makes not up in such conditions. Well, leave her, sir. For by the power that made me, I tell you all her wealth. Uh, for you, great king, I would not from your love make such a stray to match you where I hate. Therefore, I beseech you to avert your liking a more worthier way than on a wretch who nature is ashamed almost to acknowledge hers. This is most strange that she whom even but now was your best object, the argument of your praise, balm of your age, the best the dearest should in this trice of time commit a thing so monstrous to dismantle so many folds of favor. Sure, her offense must be of such unnatural degree that monsters it, or your forevouched affection fall into taint, which to believe of her must be a faith that reason without miracles should never plant in. Yet beseech your majesty, for if for I want that glib and oil art this to speak and purpose not since what I well intend, I'll do it before I speak that you make known. It is no vicious blot, murder, or foulness, no unchaste action or dishonored step that hath deprived me of your grace and honor, but even for what of that for which I am richer, a still soliciting eye and such a tongue, that I am glad I have not, though not to have it, hath lost me your liking. Better thou had not been born than not to have pleased me better. Is it but this, a tardiness in nature which often leaves the history unspoke that it intends to do? My lord of Burgundy, what say you to the lady? Love's not love when it is mingled with regards that stands aloof from the entire point. Will you have her? She is herself a dowry. Royal king, uh, give but that portion which yourself proposed, and here I take Cordelia by the hand, Duchess of Burgundy. Nothing! I have sworn I am firm. I am sorry, then. You have so lost a father that you must lose a husband. That respect and fortunes are his love, I shall not be his wife. Fairest Cordelia, that art most rich, being poor, most choice forsaken, and most loved despised, thee and thy virtues here I seize upon. Be it lawful, I take up what's cast away. Gods! Gods! Tis strange that from their colts neglect my love should kindle to inflamed respect. Thy dowerless daughter, king, thrown to my chance, is queen of us, of ours and our fair friends. Not all the dukes of watrous Burgundy can buy this unprized precious maid of me. Bid them farewell, Cordelia, though unkind. Thou losest here a better where to find. Thou hast her friends? Let her be thine, for we have no such daughter, nor shall ever see that face of hers again. Therefore be gone, without our grace, our love, our benison. Come, noble Burgundy. Bid farewell to your sisters. Our father hath washed eyes, Cordelia leaves you. I know what you are, and like a sister, I'm most loath to call. Your faults as they are named. Love well, our father. To your professed bosom, bosoms I commit him. And yet, alas, stood I within his grace, I would prefer him to a better place. So, farewell to you both. Prescribe not us our duty. Let your study be to content your Lord, who hath received you at fortune's alms. You have obedience scanted. 
and well are worth the ones you have wanted. Time shall unfold what plighted cunning hides, who covers faults at last with shame derides. So may you prosper. Come, my fair Cordelia. Sister, it is not little, I have to say, of what most nearly appertains to us both. I think our father will hence tonight. That's most certain, and with you, next month with us. You see how full of changes his age is. The observation we have made of it hath not been little. He always loved our sister most, and with what poor judgment he hath now cast her off appears too grossly. Tis the infirmity of his age, yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself. The best and soundest of his time hath been but rash. Then must we look from his age to receive not alone the imperfections of long and graft condition, but therewithal the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric years brings with them? Such unconstant stars are we like to have from him as this of Kent's banishment. There is further compliment of leave-taking between France and him. Pray you, let us sit together. If our father carry authority with such disposition as he bears, this last surrender of his will but offend us. We shall think further. We, we must, shall further think of it. We must do something, and in the heat. Act 1, Scene 2. Inside Gloucester's Castle. Enter Edmund the Bastard. Thou, nature, art my goddess. For thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom, and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me, for that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines lag of a brother? Why, bastard, wherefore base, when my dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous, and my shape as true as honest madam's issue? Why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base, base? Who, in the lusty stealth of nature, take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed go the creating a whole tribe of fops? Go, tween, asleep and wake. Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund, and to the legitimate, fine word legitimate, well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I'll grow, I'll prosper. Now gods, stand up for bastards. Can't banish thus? And France and cholera parted, and the king gone tonight prescribed his power, confined to exhibition? All this done upon the gad? Edmund, how now? What news? Uh, so please, your lordship, none. Why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? I, I know no news, my lord. What paper were you reading? Nothing, my lord. No? What needed then that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing hath no such need to hide itself. Let's see. Come, if it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all or read, and for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your o'erlooking. <clears throat> Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend either to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Ah, let's see. Let's see. I hope for my brother's justification. He wrote this but as an essay or taste of my virtue. Mm. 
this policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish it, them. I begin to find an idol and fond bondage in the oppression of age tyranny, who sways not as it hath power, but as it is suffered. Come to me, that of this I may speak more. If our father would sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue forever and live the beloved of your brother, Edgar. Hmm. Conspiracy? Sleep till I wake him, you should enjoy half his revenue? My son, Edgar? Had he a hand to write this? A heart and brain to breathe it in? When came you to this? Who, who brought it? It was not brought me, my lord. There's the cunning of it. I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet. You know the character be of your brothers? If the matter were good, my lord, I dare swear it were his. But in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his. It is his hand, my lord, but I hope his heart is not in the contents. Has he never before sounded you in this business? Never, my lord. But I have heard him oft maintain it to be fit that sons, at perfect age and fathers declined, the father should be as ward to the son, and the son manage his revenue. Oh, villain! Villain! His very opinion in the letter, aborted villain, unnatural, detested, brutish villain. Worse than brutish, go, Sarah, seek him. I'll apprehend him, abominable villain. Where, where is he? I do not know, I do not well know, my lord. If it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother till you can derive from him better testimony of his intent. You should run a certain course where if you violently proceed against him, mistaking his purpose, it, it would make a great gap in your own honor and shake in pieces the heart of his obedience. I dare pawn down my life for him that he hath writ this to feel my affection to your honor and to no other pretense of danger. Thank you so. If your honour judge it meet, I will place you where you shall hear us confer of this, and by an oracular assurance have your satisfaction, and that without any further delay than this very evening. He cannot be such a monster. Nor is not sure. To his father that so tenderly and entirely loves him, heaven and earth, Edmund, seek him out. Wind me into him, I pray you. Frame the business after your own wisdom. I would not unstate myself to be in due resolution. I will seek him, sir, presently. Convey the business as I shall find means and acquaint you with all. These late ellipses in the sun and moon pretend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, Yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. Love cools, friendships fall off, brothers divide in cities, mutinies in countries, discord in palaces, treason, and the bond crack twixt son and father. This villain of mine comes under the prediction. There's son against father. The king falls from bias of nature. There's father against child. We have seen the best of our time. Machinations, hollowness, treachery, and all ruinous disorders follows us disquietly to our graves. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully, and the noble and true-hearted Kent banished? This offense, honesty, tis strange.
this is the excellent foppery of the world, that when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeits of our own behavior, we make guilty our disasters, the sun, the moon, and stars, as if we were villains on necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves, and treachers by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars, and adulterers by an enforced obedience of planetary influence and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting on. <laughs> An admirable evasion of whoremaster man to lay his goatish disposition on the charge of a star. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it follows I am rough and lecherous. Fut. I should have been that I am, had the maidenliest star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. Edgar! And Patty comes like the catastrophe of the old comedy. My cue is villainous melancholy, with a sigh like Tom O'Bedlam. Oh, these eclipses do portend these divisions far so love. Me. <laughs> uh, how now, Brother Edmund? What serious contemplation are you in? I am thinking, brother, of a prediction I read this other day. What should follow these eclipses? Do you busy yourself with that? I promise you, the effects he writes of succeed unhappily, as of unnaturalness between child and the parent, death, Dearth, dissolution of ancient amities, divisions in state, menaces and maledictions against king and nobles, needless diffidences, banishment of friends, disposition of cohorts, nuptial breaches, and I know not what. How long have you been a sectary astronomical? Come, come. When saw you our father last? The night gone by. Spake you with him. I two hours together. Parted you in good terms? Found you no displeasure in him by word nor countenance? None at all. Bethink yourself wherein you may have offended him, and at my entreaty forbear his presence until some little time hath qualified the heat of his displeasure, which at this instant so rageth in him that with the mischief of your person it would scarcely allay. Some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you, have a continent forbearance till the speed of his rage goes slower. And as I say, retire with me to my lodging, from whence I will fitly bring you to hear my Lord speak. Pray you, go. There's my key. If you do stir abroad, go armed. Armed, brother. Brother, I advise you to the best. I am no honest man, if there be any good meaning towards you. I have told you what I have seen and heard, but faintly, nothing like the image of horror of it. Pray you, away. Shall I hear from you anon? I do serve you in this business. A credulous father and a brother noble whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none on whose foolish honesty my practices ride easy. I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit, all with me's meat that I can fashion fit. <laughs> Act 1, Scene 3. Inside the Duke of Albany's palace. Enter Goneril and Oswald, her steward. Did my father strike my gentleman for chiding of his fool? Aye, madam. By day and night he wrongs me. Every hour he flashes into one gross crime or other that sets us all at odds. I'll not endure it. His nights grow riotous and himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I will not speak with him. Say I am sick. If you come slack of former services, you shall do well. The fault of it I'll answer. He's coming, madam. I hear him. Put on what weary negligence you please, you and your fellows. I'd have it come to question. If he distasted, let him to my sister, whose mind and mine, I know, in that are one. 
not to be overruled. Idle old man, that still would manage those authorities that he hath given away. Now, by my life, old fools are babes again, and must be used with checks as flatteries when they are seen abused. Remember what I have said. Well, madam. And let his knights have colder looks among you. What grows of it, no matter. Advise your fellows so. I would breed from hence occasions, and I shall. That I may speak. I'll write straight to my sister, to hold my very course. Prepare for dinner. Act 1, Scene 4. Inside the Duke of Albany's palace. Enter Kent in disguise. If but as well I other accents borrow that can my speech diffuse, my good intent may carry through itself to that full issue for which I raise my likeness. Now, banished Kent, if thou canst serve where thou dost stand condemned, so may it come thy master whom thou lovest shall find thee full of labours. Let me not stay a jot for dinner. Go, get it ready. How now, what art thou? A uh, man, sir. Oh, what dost thou profess? Uh, what wouldst thou with us? I do profess to be no less than I seem, to serve him truly, that will put me in trust, to love him that is honest, to converse with him that is wise and says little, to fear judgment, to fight when I cannot choose, and to eat no fish. <laughs> what art thou? A very honest-hearted fellow, and as poor as the king. Well, if thou beest as poor for a subject as he's for a king, thou art poor enough. What wouldst thou? Service. Who wouldst thou serve? You. Do you, dost thou know me, fellow? And no, sir. But you have that in your countenance, which I would fain call master. What's that? Oh, th what service canst do? I can keep honest counsel, ride, run, mar a curious tale in telling it, and deliver a plain message bluntly. That which ordinary men are fit for, I am qualified in, and the best of me is diligence. How old art thou? Not so young, sir, to love a woman for singing, nor so old to dote on her for anything. I have years on my back, forty-eight. Follow me. Uh, thou shalt serve me. If I like thee no worse after dinner, I will not part from thee yet. Dinner! Oh, dinner! Where's my knave, my fool? Uh, go you, call my fool hither. <clears throat> you, you, Sarah, uh, where's my daughter? So please you. Uh, what says the fellow here? Call the clock, pull back. Where's my fool? Ho, oh, I think the world's asleep. How now, where's the mongrel? Uh, he says, my lord, your daughter is not well. Well, why came not the slave back to me when I called him? Sir, he answered me in the roundest manner, he would not. <laughs> he would not? My lord, I know not what the matter is, but to my judgment, your highness is not entertained with that ceremonious affection as you were wont. There's a great abatement of kindness appears as well in the general dependent as in the duke himself also and your daughter. Ha! Sayest thou so? I beseech you pardon me, my lord, if I be mistaken, for my duty cannot be silent when I think your highness wronged. Thou but rememberest me of mine own conception. I have perceived a most faint neglect of late, which I have rather blamed as mine own jealous curiosity than as a very pretense and purpose of unkindness. I will look further into it. But where's my fool? I have not seen him this two days. Since my young lady's gone into France, sir, the fool hath much pined away. No more of that. I have noted it well. Go you and tell my daughter I would speak with her. Uh, go you and call hither my fool. 
Oh, you, sir. You come you hither, sir. Who am I, sir? My lady's father. <laughs> My lady's father. My lord's knave, you horse and dog, you slave, you cur. I am none of these, my lord, I beseech your pardon. Do you bandy looks with me, you rascal? I will not be struck in, my lord. <laughs> oh, no, trip neither, you base football play. Uh, I thank thee, fellow, thou servest me, and I love thee. Come, sir. Arise, away, I'll teach you differences. Away, away. If you will measure your lubber's length again, tarry, but away. Go to, have you your wisdom? So. <laughs> now, uh, my friendly knave, I thank thee. There's earnest of thy service. Let me hire him too. Here's my coxcomb. How now, my pretty knave? How dost thou? Sirrah, you were best take my coxcomb. Why, my boy? Why? For taking one's part that's out of favor. Nay, and thou canst not smile as the wind sits. Thou catch cold shortly. There, take my coxcomb. Why, this fellow has banished two on's daughter and did the third a blessing against his will. If thou follow him, thou must need wear my coxcomb. How now, nuncle? What I had two coxcombs and two daughters. Oh, why, my boy? If I gave them all my living, I'd keep my coxcombs to myself. There's mine. Beg another of thy daughters. Take heed, Sirrah. The whip. Truce the dog must a kennel. He must be whipped when the lady brack may stand by the fire and stink. A pistol and gall to me. Sirrah, I'll teach you a speech. Do. Mark it, nuncle. Have more than thou showest, speak less than thou knowest, lend less than thou owest, ride more than thou goest, learn more than thou trowest, sit less than thou throwest, leave thy drink and thy whore, and keep in a door, and thou shalt have more than two tens a score. This is nothing, fool. Then tis like the breath of an unfeed lawyer, you gave me nothing for it. Can you make no use of nothing, uncle? Why, no, boy, nothing can be made out of nothing. Prithee, tell him so much the rent of his land comes to, he will not believe a fool. Oh, a bitter fool. Dost know the difference, my boy, between a bitter fool and a sweet one? No, lad, teach me. That lord that counseled thee to give away thy land, come place him here by me. Do thou forstand him? The sweet and bitter fool will presently appear, the one in motley here, the other found out there. Dost thou call me fool, boy? All thy other titles thou hast given away, that thou was born with. This is not altogether fool, my lord. No, faith, lords and great men will not let me. If I had monopoly out, they would have part on it. And ladies, too, they will not let me have all the fool to myself. They'll be snatching. Nuncle, give me an egg, and I will have the two crowns. What two crowns shall they be? Why, after I have cut the egg in the middle and eat up the meat, the two crowns of the egg. When thou clovest thy crown in the middle and gavest away both parts, thou borest thine ass as on thy back or the dirt. Thou hadst little wit in thy bald crown when thou gavest thy golden one away. If I speak like myself in this, let him he be whipped that first finds it so. Fools and had ne'er less grace in a year, for wise men are grown foppish, and know not now their wits to where their manners are so apish. When were you want to be so full of songs, Sirrah? I've had used it, Nuncle, ere since thou madest thy daughters thy mothers, for when thou gavest them the rod and puts thy own breeches. And when and then they wore sudden joy did weep, and I for sorrow sung, and such a king should play bo peep, and go the fools among. Prithee, Nuncle, keep a schoolmaster that can teach thy fool to lie. I would fain learn to lie. Or you lie, Sarah, we'll have you whipped. I marvel what kin thou and thy daughters are. They'll have me whipped for speaking true. They'll have me whipped for lying. And sometimes I am whipped for lie for holding my peace. I'd rather be any kind of thing than a fool. 
and yet I would not be thee, nuncle. Thou hast paired thy wit o' both sides and left nothing in the middle. Ah, here comes one of the pairings. How now, daughter? What makes that frontlet on? Methinks you are too much of late of the frown. <laughs> thou was a pretty fellow when thou hadst no need to care for her frowning. Thou, now thou art an O without a figure. I am better than thou art now. I am a fool. Thou art nothing. Yes, forsooth, I will hold my tongue, so your face bids me, though you will say nothing. Mum, mum, he that keeps no crust nor crumb, weary of all, shall want some. That's a shelled peas cod. Not only, sir, this your all licensed fool, but other of your insolent retinue do hourly carp and quarrel, breaking forth in rank and not to be endured right, sir. I had thought, by making this well known unto you, to have found a safe redress, but now grow fearful by what yourself too late have spoke and done, that you protect this course and put it on by your allowance, which if you should, the fault would not scape censure, nor the redresses sleep, which in the tender of a wholesome wheel might in their working do you that offense, which else were shame that then necessity will call discreet proceeding. For you know, Nuncle, the hedge sparrow fed the cuckoo so long that it's had it head bit off by it young. So out went the candle and we were left in darkling. Are you our daughter? I would, you would, make use of your good wisdom, whereof I know you are fraught, and put away these dispositions which of late transport you from what you rightly are. May not an ass know when the cart draws the horse? Whoop, Jug, I love thee. Does any here know me? This is not Lear. Does Lear walk thus, speak thus, wear her his eyes? Either his notion weakens, his discernings are lethargy. Ha! <laughs> Walking! Tis not so. Who is it that can tell me who I am? Ooh, Lear's shadow. I would learn that for by the marks of sovereignty, knowledge, and reason. I should be false persuaded. I had daughters. Which they will make an obedient father. Your name, fair gentlewoman. This admiration, sir, is much the savor of other your new pranks. I do beseech you to understand my purposes aright, as you are old and reverend should be wise. Here do you keep a hundred knights and squires, men so disordered, so debauched and bold, that this our court, infected with their manners, shows like a riotous inn, epicurism, and lust, makes it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced palace. The shame itself doth speak, for instant remedy be then desired. By her that else will take the thing she begs, a little to disquantity your train. And the remainders that shall still depend to be such men as may besort your age, which know themselves in you. Darkness and devils! Saddle my horses, call my trains together. Degenerate bastard, I'll not trouble thee, yet have I left a daughter. You strike my people, and your disordered rabble makes servants of their betters. Whoa, the too lace repents. Oh, sir, are you come? Is it your will? Speak, sir, prepare my horses. In gratitude, thou marble-hearted fiend, more hideous when thou showest thee in a child than the sea monster. Pray, sir, be patient. Detested kite, thou liest. My train are men of choice and rarest parts that all particulars of duty know and in the most exact regard support the worships of their name. Ah, my small fault. How ugly didst thou in Cordelia show, which, like an engine, wrenched my frame of nature from the fixed place, drew from my heart all love, and added to the gall. Oh, Lear, Lear, Lear! Beat at this gate that let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out. Go, go, my people. Uh, my lord, I am guiltless as I am ignorant of what hath moved you. It may be so, my lord. Here, nature, here. Dear goddess, hear, suspend thy purpose thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility. Dry up in her the organs of increase. And from her derogate body never spring a babe to honor her. Or she must teem, 
create her a child of spleen, that it may live and be a thwart, disnatured torment to her, that it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth, and with caking tears fret channels in her cheeks, turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt, that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. Away! Away. Oh, gods that we adore, whereof comes this? Never afflict yourself to know more of it, but let his disposition have that scope as dotage gives it. What? Fifty of my followers at a clap within a fortnight! What's the matter, sir? Oh, I'll tell thee. Life and death I am ashamed! That thou hast power to shake my manhood thus. That these hot tears which break from me perforce should make thee worse than blasts and fogs upon thee. The untended woundlings of a father's curse pierce every sense about thee. Hold, fond eyes, beweep this cause again. I'll pluck you out and cast you with the waters that you loose to temper clay. Yea, is it come to this? Ha! Let it be so. I have another daughter who I am sure is kind and comfortable when she shall hear this of thee with her nails. She'll flay thy wolfish visage. Thou shalt find that I'll resume the sheep which thou dost think I have cast off forever. Do you mark that? I cannot be so partial, Goneril, uh, to the great love I bear you. I pray you, content. What, Oswald, ho? You, sir, more knave than fool, after your master. Nuncleer, Nuncleer, Terry, take the fool with thee. A fox, when one has caught her, and such a daughter, should sure to the slaughter, if my cap would buy a halter, so the fool follows after. This man hath had good counsel, a hundred knights, Tis politic and safe to let him keep at point a hundred nights. Yes, that on every dream, each buzz, each fancy, each complaint, dislike, he may engard his dotage with their powers and hold our lives in mercy. Oswald, I say! Well, you may fear too far. Safer than trust too far? Let me still take away the harms I fear, not fear still to be taken. I know his heart. Would he have uttered, I have writ my sister, if she sustain him and his hundred knights when I have showed the unfitness? How now, Oswald? What, have you writ that letter to my sister? I, madam. Take you some company and away to horse. Inform her full of my particular fear, and thereto add such reasons of your own as may compact it more. Get you gone, and hasten your return. No, no, my lord, this milky gentleness and course of yours, though I condemn not yet under pardon, you are much more at task for want of wisdom than praised for harmful mildness. How far your eyes may pierce, I cannot tell. Striving to better, oft we mar what's well. Nay, then with... Uh, well, well, the event. Act 1, Scene 5. A courtyard at the Duke of Albany's palace. Enter Lear, Kent in disguise, gentleman, and fool. Are you before to Gloucester with these letters? Acquaint my daughter no further with anything you know than comes from her demand out of the letter. If your diligence be not speedy, I shall be there afore you. I will not sleep, my lord, until I have delivered your letter. brains were in his heels, were not in danger of kibes. Aye, boy. Then I prithee, be merry, thy wit shall not go slipshod. <laughs> shall see thy other daughter, will use thee kindly, for though she's as like, this is a crab like an apple, yet I can tell what I can tell. What canst tell, boy? She will taste as like this is a crab does to a crab. 
thou canst tell why one's nose stands in the middle of one's face. No. Why, to keep one's eyes of the other side of the nose, that what a man cannot smell, he may spy into. <laughs> I did her wrong. Canst tell how an ostoy marks the shell? No. Nor I either, but I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? Why, to put its head in, not to give it away to his daughters and leave his horns without a case. I will forget my nature. So kind of father. Be my horses ready. Thy asses are gone about them. The reason why the seven stars are no more than seven is a pretty reason. <laughs> because they are not eight. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thou wouldst make a good fool. Oh, to take again perforce. Monster ingratitude. If thou wert my fool, uncle, I'd have thee beaten for being old before thy time. How's that? Thou shouldst not have been old till thou hadst been wise. Oh, let me not be mad. Not mad, sweet heaven. Keep me in temper, I would not be mad. Oh, no. Are the horses ready? Ready, my lord. Come, boy. She that's a maid now and laughs at my departure shall not be a maid long unless things be cut shorter. Save thee, Kern. And, uh, and you, sir, I have been with your father and have given him notice that the Duke of Cornwall and Regan, his duchess, will be here with him this night. How comes that? Nay, I know not. You have heard of the news abroad. I mean, the whispered ones, for they are yet but ear-kissing arguments. Not I, pray you. What are they? Have you heard of no likely wars toward twixt the Dukes of Cornwall and Albany? Not a word. You may do then in time. Fare you well, sir. The Duke be here tonight, the better best. This weaves itself perforce into my business. <laughs> my father hath set guard to take my brother, and I have one thing of a queasy question, which I must act. Briefness and fortune work. Brother, a word. Descend. Brother, I say. My father watches. Oh, sir, fly this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. You have now the good advantage of the night. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall? He's coming hither now, in the night, in the haste, and Regan with him. Have you nothing said upon his party against the Duke of Albany? Advise yourself. I am sure, Aunt, not a word. I hear my father coming. Pardon me. In cunning, I must draw my sword upon you. Draw. Seem to defend yourself. Now, quit you well. Yield. Come before my father. Light, ho, here. Fly, brother. Torches, torches. So farewell. Some blood drawn on me would beget opinion of my more fierce endeavour. I have seen drunkards do more than this is this in sport. Father, father, stop, stop, no, help. Now, Edmund, where, where is the villain? Oh, here stood he in the dark, his sharp sword out, mumbling of wicked charms, conjuring the moon to stand auspicious mistress. But, but where is he? Look, sir, I bleed. Where is the villain, Edmund? Fled this, this way, sir, when by no means he could. Pursue him, ho! Go after! By, by no means what? Oh, Persuade me to the murder of your lordship. 
but that I told him the revenging gods gainst parasites did all the thunder bend, spoke with how manifold and strong a bond the child was bound to the father. Sir, in fine, seeing how loathly opposite I stood to his unnatural purpose, in fell motion with his prepared sword he charges home. My unprovided body lanced mine arm, and when he saw my best alarmed spirits, bold in the quarrel's right, roused to the encounter, or whether ghasted by the noise I made, full suddenly he fled. Let him fly far. Not in this land shall he remain uncaught, and found dispatched. The noble duke, my master, my worthy arch and patron, comes tonight. By his authority I will proclaim it, that he which finds him shall deserve our thanks, bringing the murderous coward to the stake. He that conceals him, death. When I dissuaded him from his intent and found him pipe to do it, with cursed speech I threatened to discover him. He replied, Thou unpossessing bastard, dost thou think if I would stand against thee, would the reposal of any trust, virtue, or worth in thee make thy words faith? No. What should I deny? As this I would, though thou didst produce my very character. I turn it all to thy suggestion, plot and damned practice. And thou must make a dullard of the world, if they not thought the prophets of my death were very pregnant and potential spurs to make thee seek it. Oh, strange and fastened villain. Would he deny this letter, said he? I never got him. Ha, ah, the Duke's trumpets. I know not why he comes, all ports, I'll bar. The villain shall not scape. The Duke must grant me that. Besides, his picture I will send far and near that all the kingdom may have due note of him. And of my land, loyal and natural boy, I'll work the means to make thee capable. How now, my noble friend, since I came hither, which I can call but now, I have heard strange news. If it be true, all vengeance comes too short, which can pursue the offender. How dost, my lord? Oh, madam, my old heart is cracked. It's cracked. What, did my father's godson seek your life? He whom my father named your Edgar? Oh, lady, lady, shame would have it hid. Was he not companion with the riotous knights that tended upon my father? I know not, madam. Tis too bad, too bad. Yes, madam, he was of that consort. No marvel then, though he were ill affected. Tis they have put him on the old man's death to have the expense and waste of his revenues. I have this present evening from my sister been well informed of them and with such cautions that if they come to sojourn at my house, I'll not be there. Nor I assure thee, Regan. Edmund, I hear that you have shown your father a childlike office. It was my duty, sir. He did bewray his practice and receive this hurt you see striving to apprehend him. Is he pursued? Aye, my good lord. If he be taken, he shall never more be feared of doing harm. Make your own purpose, how in my strength you please. For you, Edmund, whose virtue and obedience does this instance so much commend itself, you shall be ours. Natures of such deep trust we shall much need. You we first seize on. I shall serve you, sir, truly, however else. For him I thank your grace. You know not why we came to visit you. Thus, out of season, threading dark-eyed night, occasions, noble Gloucester, of some poise, wherein we must have use of your advice. Our father, he hath writ, so hath our sister, of differences, which I best thought it fit to answer from our home. The several messengers from hence attend dispatch. Our good old friend lays comforts to your bosom and bestow your needful counsel to our businesses, which crave the instant use. 
I serve you, madam. Your graces are right welcome. Act two, scene two. Within the gates of Gloucester's castle, enter Kent in disguise and Oswald, the steward. Good dawning to thee, friend. Out of this house? Aye. Where may we set our horses? In the mire. Prithee, if thou lovest me, tell me. I love thee not. Why, then, I care not for thee. If I had thee in Lipsbury Pinfold, I would make thee care for me. Why dost thou use me thus? I know thee not. Fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, a base, proud, shallow, beggarly, three-suited, hundred-pound, filthy worsted stocking knave, a lily-livered, action-taking, whoresome, glass-gazing, super-serviceable, finical rogue, one trunk inheriting slave, one that would be a bod in a way of good service, and art nothing but the comparison of a knave, beggar, coward, pander, and the son and heir of a mongrel bitch, one whom I will beat into clamorous whining if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition. Why, what a monstrous fellow thou art, though thus to rail on one that is neither known of thee nor knows thee. What a brazen-faced varlet art thou to deny thou knowest me? Is it two days ago since I tripped up thy heels and beat thee before the king? Draw you, rogue, for though it be night, yet the moon shines, I'll make a sop of the moonshine of you, you horse and cullionly barbermonger. Draw! Away! I have nothing to do with thee. Draw, you rascal! You come with letters against, against the king and take vanity the puppet's part against the royalty of her father? Draw, you rogue, or I'll so carbonado your shanks. Draw, you rascal, come your ways. Help! Ho! Murder! Help! Strike, you slave. Stand, rogue, stand, you neat slave. Strike! Oh, ow. Help! Help! Murder! Murder! How now, what's the matter? Part! Good men, boy, if you please. Come, I'll flesh you. Come on, young master. Weapons, arms, what's the matter here? Keep peace upon your lives. He dies that strikes again. What is the matter? The messengers from our sister and the king. What is your difference? Speak. I am scarce in, in breath, my lord. No marvel, you've so bestirred your valor. Cowardly rascal, nature disclaims in thee, a tailor made thee. Thou art a strange fellow, a tailor make a man. A tailor, sir, a stone cutter or a painter could not have made him so ill, though they had been but two years of the trade. Speak yet, how grew your quarrel? This ancient ruffian, sir, whose life I have spared at suit of his gray beard. Thou horse and zed, thou unnecessary letter. My lord, if you will give me leave, I will tread this unbolted villain into mortar and daub the wall as it jakes with him. Spare my gray beard, you wagtail. Peace, sirrah. You beastly knave, know you no reverence. Yes, sir, but anger hath a privilege. Why art thou angry? That such a slave as this should wear a sword who wears no honesty. Such smiling rogues as these, like rats, oft bite the holy cords a twain, which are too entrenched and loose, smooth every passion that in the natures of their lords rebel, being oil to fire, snow to the colder moods, renege affirm and turn their halicon beaks with every gale and vary of their masters, knowing not, like dogs, but following, a plague upon your epileptic visage. Smile, you, my speeches, as I were a fool. Goose, if I had, if I had you upon Sarum Plain, I'd drive you cackling home to, to Camelot. What, art thou mad, old fool? I'll fell you out, say that. No, contraries hold more antipathy than I and such a knave. Why dost thou call him knave? What is his fault? His countenance likes me not. 
No more perchance does mine, nor his, nor hers. Sir, tis my occupation to be plain. I have seen better faces in my time than stands on any shoulder than I see before me at this instant. This is some fellow who, having been praised for bluntness, doth affect a saucy roughness and constrains the garb quite from his nature. He cannot flatter he. An honest mind and plain, he must speak truth. And they will take it, so, if not, he's plain. These kinds of knaves I know, which in this plainness harbor more craft and more corrupter ends than twenty silly ducking observants that stretch their duties nicely. Sir, in good faith, in sincere verity, under the allowance of your great aspect, whose influence like the wreath of radiant fire on flickering Phoebus front. What means by this? To go out of my dialect, which you discommend so much. I know, sir, I am no flatterer. He that beguiled you in a plain accent was a plain knave, which for my part I will not be, though I should win your displeasure to entreat me to it. What was the offense you gave him? Never gave him any. It pleased the king, his master, very light, to strike at me upon his misconstruction, when he, compact and flattering his displeasure, tripped me behind, being down, insulted, railed, and put upon him such a deal of man that worthy him, got praises of the king for him attempting, who was self-subdued, and in the fleshment of this dread exploit, drew on me here again. None of these rogues and cowards, but Ajax is their fool. Fetch forth the stocks. You stubborn ancient knave, you reverent braggart, we'll teach you. Sir, I am too old to learn. Call not your stocks for me. I serve the king, on whose employment I was sent to you. You shall do small respect to show too bold malice against the grace and person of my master, stocking his messenger. Fetch forth the stocks, as I have life and honor, there shall he sit till noon. Till noon, till night, my lord, and all night, too. Why, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. Sir, being his knave, I will. This is a fellow of the selfsame color our sister speaks of. Come, bring away the stocks. Let me beseech your grace not to do so. His fault is much, and the good king, his master, will check him for it. Your purposed low correction is such as base it and contemn it. Wretches for pilferings and most common trespasses are punished with. The king must take it ill that he so slightly valued in his messenger should have him thus restrained. I'll answer that. My sister may receive it much more worse to have her gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs, put in his legs. Come, my good lord, away. I am sorry for thee, friend. Tis the duke's pleasure, whose disposition all the world well knows will not be rubbed nor stopped. I'll entreat for thee. Pray do not, sir. I have watched and traveled hard. Sometime I shall sleep out, the rest I'll whistle. The good man's fortune may grow out at his heels. Give you good morrow. The Duke's to blame in this. Twill be ill taken. Good King, the must approve the common sore. Thou art of heaven's benediction comes to the warm sun. Approach, thou beacon to this under globe, that by the comfortable beams I may peruse this letter. Nothing almost sees miracles but mi misery. A note is from Cordelia, who hath most, unfortunate, most fortunately been informed of my obscured course, and shall find time from this enormous state, seeking to give love losses their remedies. All weary and o'erwatched, take vantage, heavy eyes, not to behold this shameful lodging. Fortune, good night. Smile once more. Turn thy wheel. Act Two, Scene Three. Open country in the neighborhood of Gloucester's castle. Enter Edgar. 
I heard myself proclaimed, and by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. Whilst I may escape, I will preserve myself and have be, am bethought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury in contempt of man brought near to beast. My face I'll grime with filth, blanket my loins, elf all my hair in knots, and with presented nakedness, outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified arms, pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary, and with this horrible object from low farms, poor pelting villages, sheep coats and mills, sometime with lunatic bands, sometime with prayers, enforce their charity. Poor Torley God, poor Tom. There's something yet. Edgar, I nothing am. Act two, scene four, within the gates of Gloucester's castle, Kent in the stocks, enter to him Lear, fool, and a gentleman. Tis strange they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger. As I learned the night before, there was no purpose in them of this remove. Hail to thee, noble master. Makes all this shame my pastime. No, my lord. Ah, he wears cruel garters. Horses are tied by the heads, dogs and bears by the neck, monks eat by the loin, and men by the legs, when a man's over lusty at legs, when he wears wooden nether stocks. What's he that hath so much thy place mistook to set thee here? It is both he and she, your son and daughter. No. Yes. No, I say. I say yea. By Jupiter, I swear no. By Juno, I swear I. They, dare, they durst not do it. They could not, would not do it. Tis worse than murder. To, to do upon respect such violent outrage. Resolve me with all modest haste which way thou mightst deserve, or they impose this usage coming from us. My lord... When at their home I did commend your highness letters to them, ere I was risen from the palace that showed my duty kneeling, came there a reeking post, stewed in his haste, half breathless, panting forth from Goneril, his mistress salutations, delivered letters, spite of intermission, which presently they read, on whose contents they summoned up their mandy. Straight took horse, commanded me to follow and attend the leisure of their answer, gave me cold looks, and meeting here the other messenger, whose welcome I perceived had poisoned mine, being the very fellow which of late displayed so saucily against your highness, having more man than wit about me, drew. He raised the house with loud and coward cries. Your son and daughter found this trespass worth the shame which here it suffers. Winter's not gone yet if the wild geese fly that way. Fathers that wear rags do make their children blind, but fathers that bear bags shall see their children kind. Fortune that a rant whore ne'er turns the key to the poor. But for all this thou shalt have as many dollars for thy daughter as thou canst tell in a knee in a year. Oh, how this mother swells up toward my heart. Hysterica passio down no climbing sorrow. Thy elements below. Where is this daughter? With the earl, sir, here within. Follow me not. Stay here. Made you no more offense by what you spake of? None. How chance the king comes with so small a number? And thou hadst been set i' the stocks for that question, thou dost well deserve it. Why, fool? We'll see, set thee to school. To an ant teach thee there's no laboring in the winter. 
All that follow their noses are led by their eyes, but blind men, and there's not a nose among twenty but can smell them that's stinking. Let go thy holds when a great wheel runs down a hill, lest it break thy neck with following. But the great one that does upward, let him draft thee after. When a wise man gives thee better counsel, give me mine again. I would have none but knaves follow it, since a fool gives it. The sir which serves and seeks for gain, and follows but for form, will pack it when be it begins to rain, and leave thee in the storm. But I will tarry, the fool will stay, and let the wise men fly. The knave turns the fool that runs away, the fool no knave per die. Where learned you this, fool? Not in the stocks, fool. Deny to speak with me. They are sick. They are weary. They have traveled all the night. Mere fetches the images of revolt and flying off. Fetch me a better answer. My dear Lord, do you know the fiery quality of the Duke, how unremovable and fixed he is in his own course? Vengeance, plague, death, confusion, fiery. What quality? Why, Gloucester, Gloucester, I'd speak with the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, my good lord, I have informed them so. Informed them? Dost thou understand me, man? I, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would, with his daughter, speak, commands, tends service. Are they informed of this, my breath and blood? Fiery, the fiery duke. Tell the hot duke that, no, but not yet. Maybe he is not well. Infirmity doth still neglect all office whereto our health is bound. We are not ourselves when nature being oppressed commands the mind to suffer with the body, I'll forbear and am fallen out with my more headier will to take the indisposed and sickly fit for the sound man. Death on my state, wherefore should he sit here? This act persuades me that this rem This act persuades me that this remotion of the duke and her is practice only. Give me my servant forth. Go tell the duke and his wife I'd speak with them. Now, presently, bid them come forth and hear me, or at their chamber door I'll beat the drum till it cry sleep to death. I would have all well betwixt you. Oh, me, my heart, my rising heart. But down. Pride to it, Nuncle, as the cockney did to the eels when she put him in the paste alive. She napped him o' the coxcomb with a stick, and cried, Down, wantons, down! Twas her brother then, pure kindness to his horses, buttered his hay. Good morrow to you both. Hail to your grace. I am glad to see your highness. <gasps> Regan, I think you are. I know what reason I have to think so. If thou shouldst not be glad, I would divorce from me thy mother's tomb, sepulchring an adulteress. Oh, are you free? Some other time for that. Beloved Regan, thy sister's not. Oh, Regan, she has tied sharp-toothed unkindness like a vulture here. I can scarce speak to thee. Thou'lt not believe with how depraved a quality, oh, Regan. I pray you, sir, take patience. I have hope you less know how to value her desert than she scant to her duty. Say, how is that? I cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation, if, sir, perchance, she hath restrained the riots of your followers, tis on such ground and to such wholesome end as clears her. From all blame. My curses on her. Sir, you are old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of his confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore, 
I pray you that to our sister you do make return, say you have wronged her. Ask her forgiveness! Do you but mark how this becomes the house? Dear daughter, I confess that I am old, age is unnecessary. On my knees I beg that you'll vouchsafe me raiment, bed, and food. Good sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Never, Regan. She hath abated me of half my train, looked black upon me, struck me with her tongue more serpent-like upon the very heart, all the stored vengeances of heaven fall on her in grateful top. Strike her, young bones. You taking airs with lameness. Fie, sir, fie. You nimble lightnings dart your blinding flames in her scornful eyes. Infect her beauty, you fen-sucked fogs drawn by the powerful sun to fall and blister. Oh, the blessed gods, so will you wish on me when the rash mood is on? No, Regan, thou shalt never have my curse. Thy tender hefted nature shall not give thee o'er to harshness. Her eyes are fierce. Thine do comfort and not burn. Tis not in thee to grudge my pleasures, to cut off my train, to bandy hasty words, to scant my sizes, and in conclusion to oppose the bolt against my coming in. Thou better knowest the offices of nature, bond of childhood, effects of courtesy, dues of gratitude. Thy half of the kingdom hast thou not forgot, wherein I thee in doubt. Good, sir, to the purpose. Who put my man in the stocks? What trumpet's that? I know it. My sister's. This approves her letter that she would soon be here. Is your lady come? This is a slave whose easy borrowed pride dwells in the fickle grace of her he follows. Out will it from my sight. What means your grace? Who stalked my servant? Regan, I have good hope thou didst not know it. Who comes here? Oh, heavens, if you do love old men, if your sweet sway allow obedience, if you yourselves are old, make it your cause. Send down and take my part. I'm not ashamed to look upon this beard. Oh, Regan, will you take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offense that indiscretion finds and dotage turns so. Oh, sides you are too tough. Will you yet hope? How came my man in the stocks? I set him there, sir, but his own disorders deserved much less advancement. You, did you? I pray you, Father, being weak, seem so. If till the expiration of your month you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. I am now from home and out of that provision, which shall be needful for your entertainment. Return to her! And fifty men dismissed! No! Rather, I abjure all roofs and choose to wage against the enmity of the air. To be a comrade with the wolf and our necessity sharp pinch, return with her! Oh, by the hot blood in France that dowerless took our youngest born, I could as well be brought to knee his throne and squire like pension beg to keep base life afoot. Return with her. Persuade me rather to be slave and sumpter to this detested groom. At your choice, sir. I pray thee, daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. We will no more meet, no more see one another. But yet thou art my flesh. My blood, my daughter, or rather, a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, or embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. 
but I'll not chide thee. Let shame come when it will. I do not call it. I do not bid the thunder bearer shoot, nor tell tales of thee to high judging Jove. Mend what thou canst. Be better at thy leisure. I can be patient. I can stay with Regan, I and my hundred knights. Not altogether so. I looked not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister, for those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old and so, but she knows what she does. Is this well spoken? I dare avouch it, sir. What, fifty followers? Is it not well? What should you need of more? Ye or so many sith that both charge and danger speak against so great a number. How in one house should many people under two commands hold amity? Tis hard, almost impossible. Why might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she calls servants or from mine? Why not, my lord, if then they chance to slack you, we could control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all! In good time you gave it. Made you guardians, my depositaries, but kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. What? Must I come to you with five and twenty? Regan said you so. And speak it again, my lord. No more with me. Those wicked creatures yet do look well favored when others are more wicked. Not being the worst stands in some rank of praise. I'll go with thee. Thy fifty yet doth double five and twenty. And thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty, ten or five, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? What need one? Oh! Reason! What the need? Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm were gorgeous, why, nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, which scarcely keeps thee warm. But for true need, oh, you, heavens, give me that patience, patience I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stirs these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, and let not women's weapons, water drops, stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags. I will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall I will do such things. What they are yet, I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws ere I'll weep. Oh, fool. I shall go mad. Let us withdraw, there'll be a storm. This house is little. The old man's people cannot be well bestowed. Tis his own blame hath put himself from rest, and must needs taste his folly. For his particular, I'll receive him gladly, but not one follower. So am I purposed. Where is my lord of Gloucester? I have followed the old man forth. He is returned. The king is in high rage. Whither is he going? He calls for, to horse, but will I know not whither? Tis best to give him way. He leads himself. My lord, entreat him by no means to stay. Alack, the night comes on, and the high winds do sorely ruffle. For many miles about, there's scarce a bush. 
Oh, sir, to willful men the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. Shut up your doors, he is attended with a desperate train, and what they may incense him to, being apt to have his ear abused, wisdom bids fear. Shut up your doors, my lord, tis a wild night, my Regan counsels well. Come out of the storm, 